Hello everyone and welcome to the Science AAAS webinar entitled Deciphering Cancer, the Intersection of Epigenetics, Metabolism and Tumorigenesis. I'm Sean Sanders, Editor for Custom Publishing at Science and I'll be your moderator for this webinar. This is the third webcast in our in-depth and informative Deciphering Cancer series. The first two can be found in our archives at webinar.sciencemag.org or through the links just above the slide window in your viewing console. It is now well known that epigenetic modifications to DNA and histone proteins can regulate metabolic gene expression, which in turn impacts metabolite levels. Conversely, the machinery responsible for modifying DNA and histones at the epigenetic level is highly sensitive to metabolites arising from cellular metabolism. Thus, the metabolic changes associated with oncogenesis may affect the epigenetic machinery, creating a feedback loop that synergistically promotes the progression of cancer. This webinar will examine how, by targeting proteins responsible for the crosstalk between epigenetics and metabolism, we may be able to develop new and effective therapeutic options for cancer treatment. We have two wonderful speakers with us today who will be sharing their research and expertise. Dr. Catherine Wellen from the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia, and Dr. Jason Locasell from Duke University in Durham, North Carolina. Thank you both so much for joining us. Before we get started, I'd like to share some information for our online viewers. At the top right of your screen, you'll find photographs of today's speakers and a view bio link, which you can click on to read more details about their background and research. Underneath the slide viewer is the resources tab where you can find additional information about technologies related to today's discussion and a PDF of the slides. After the speaker presentations, we will have a short Q&A session during which we will address some of the questions submitted by our live online viewers. So if you're joining us live, start thinking about some questions now and submit them at any time by clicking the Ask a Question button below the slide window, typing the question into the message box, and then clicking OK. You can also log into your Facebook, Twitter, or LinkedIn accounts during the webinar to post updates or send tweets about the event. Just click the relevant icon at the top left of the screen. For tweets, you can add the hashtag #ScienceWebinar. Finally, thank you to Cell Signaling Technology for sponsoring today's webinar. Now I'd like to introduce our first speaker for today, Dr. Catherine Wellen. Dr. Wellen has been an assistant professor in the Department of Cancer Biology at the University of Pennsylvania since 2011. Her laboratory studies the impact of cellular metabolism on the epigenome, focusing on the role of acetyl-CoA in regulating histone acetylation. Her lab aims to elucidate the physiological functions of metabolic control of the epigenome and how its deregulation contributes to the development and progression of cancer and diabetes. A very warm welcome to you, Dr. Wellen, and thank you for speaking with us today. Okay, well, thank you, Sean, for the introduction, and, and thank you uh, to Science Magazine for the opportunity to participate in this webinar in which we'll be exploring this exciting intersection between epigenetics and metabolism in the context of cancer biology. So the, the concept that metabolism is reprogrammed in cancer is actually a really old concept within the field of cancer biology, really dating back to the 1920s and the pioneering work of Otto Warburg, uh, in which uh, Warburg identified that in contrast to normal tissues, tumors really uh, show increased glucose uptake and lactate production, and this occurs really even in the presence of uh, sufficient oxygen. And this, this concept of elevated glycolysis with lactate production is what's commonly referred to as aerobic glycolysis or the Warburg effect. And it's one of the most well-appreciated um, alterations in metabolism that is observed in cancer. Now, of course, today we have a much more sophisticated and nuanced understanding of the metabolic alterations that take place in cancer. Uh, for example, uh, we now understand that oncogenic signaling can direct changes in nutrient acquisition, both by stimulating uptake of glucose and amino acids into the cell via cellular transporters, as well as through engagement of opportunistic modes of nutrient acquisition, such as macropinocytosis. In addition to stimulating nutrient uptake, oncogenic signaling can also redirect 
uh, intracellular metabolism to facilitate use of glycolytic and TCA cycle intermediates for biosynthesis to allow cells to make the proteins and the lipids and the nucleic acids that they need to grow and divide. So we now have uh, sort of a, a strong appreciation for the notion that oncogenic signaling can impact cellular metabolism, both its uptake and its uh, utilization within the cell. But what's a concept that's really growing in appreciation now is the notion that this really is a reciprocal relationship and that metabolism can feed back on and regulate signaling and regulate uh, gene regulatory networks in order to mediate changes in cell behavior and function. And one way that this can occur is through metabolite-driven changes in chromatin modifications, and, and that will be the topic of our discussion today. Um, but before we really uh, dig in and uh, talk about how metabolism can impact the epigenome, I think it, it of course, bears mentioning that cancer cells uh, really exhibit profound epigenomic alterations that can impact gene expression profiles, genome stability, uh, differentiation state, and that really epigenetic alterations collaborate with genetic mutations to regulate tumor development and progression really at all levels. And, of course, these epigenetic alterations can occur as a consequence of mutations in epigenetic, uh, in genes encoding epigenetic modifiers. But uh, there's emerging evidence, and, of course, this is what we're talking about today, that perhaps changes in metabolism may also be a factor contributing to epigenetic alterations that are observed in cancer. So... The histone code hypothesis was originally posited a number of years ago by Strahl and Alice, and this really put forward the idea that uh, these histone tail modifications can be interpreted by the cell sequentially or combinatorially in order to mediate downstream functions. Uh, and when we think about how uh, these chromatin modifications are regulated, we really think about this in terms of three different types of, of uh, proteins that mediate these modifications, and these are the writer enzymes uh, that add the modification, uh, so acetyltransferases, methyltransferases, eraser enzymes that remove the modification, and then readers that will bind and interpret to mediate downstream effects. But from a metabolism standpoint, you can imagine that if you're going to write a particular chromatin modification, you really need to have lead in your pencil or ink in your pen. Um, and if you think about it, the, the substrates used by these chromatin-modifying enzymes really are metabolites. Uh, and so an idea that we, uh, along with the Michalakis group, have tried to put forward uh, recently in a review article is that we really should be thinking about metabolic enzymes that produce this, this ink, these metabolite substrates, um, as another level at which chromatin modifications really can be regulated. Um, and, and so to give you a couple of examples of this, um, so histones and other proteins in the cell can be glycosylated, and this relies on glucose utilization in a pathway called the hexosamine biosynthesis, hexosamine biosynthesis pathway. Uh, and this produces uh, the metabolite UDP and acetylglucosamine that is used by uh, the writer enzyme OGT, or oglycnac transferase, to glycosylate histones and other proteins in the cell. Likewise, acetyl-CoA, a central metabolite in the cell, is used by lysine acetyltransferase enzymes to acetylate histones uh, and other proteins in the cell. Acetylmethionine. Uh, synthesized from methionine and ATP, is the key methyl donor used by histone and DNA methyl transferases. Uh, eraser enzymes can also be impacted by metabolism. So, for example, sirtuin d acetylases rely on NAD, uh, whereas Jumanji domain histone demethylases and TET-5-methylcytosine uh, dioxygenases uh, employ alpha-ketoglutarate as a co-substrate. Um, and uh, the product of that reaction, succinate, as well as other uh, related metabolites, fumarate and 2-hydroxyglutarate, can actually interfere with the ability uh, of those enzymes to use alpha-ketoglutarate and, and impact their activity. Um, and so in, in the two presentations that you're going to hear today, I'm going to focus largely on acetyl-CoA metabolism and influence on histone acetylation, um, and then you'll hear a lot more about metabolic control of methylation in Jason's presentation uh, following mine.
I think it also really bears mentioning here that phosphorylation is really a, a very different paradigm than what we're talking about in terms of acetyl-CoA regulation of acetylation, SAM regulation of methylation. So, so in terms of phosphorylation, it, it's worth noting that ATP levels in the cell actually are, are very high in the millimolar range, um, much higher than levels that are needed to saturate kinase active sites. And so you never really see the availability of, a, of ATP as regulatory for uh, kinase activity, except in the case of AMPK, which, which um, has evolved to sense the AMP to ATP ratio, and so that's a specialized kinase. But we're talking about a very different mode of regulation by metabolism in the case of modifications like acetylation and methylation than for phosphorylation. Okay, so I also wanted to, to bring up the point that when we think about uh, how metabolism can regulate chromatin modifications, I, I like to conceptualize this into three different main paradigms or modes through which metabolites can act. Um, and, and the first mode is uh, via inhibitor metabolite production and impact on chromatin modification. So, uh, this is really exemplified uh, by isocitrate dehydrogenase mutations, which uh, so uh, mutations in IDH result in a neo acquisition of a neomorphic activity that results in the enzyme producing uh, the so-called oncometabolite 2-hydroxyglutarate. Uh, and what this does is interfere with the ability of uh, certain uh, alpha ketoglutarate dependent enzymes, including the TET enzymes and, and Jumanji domain histone demethylases, to use alpha ketoglutarate um, and thus resulting in a hypermethylation phenotype in tumors with these mutations. And so, uh, and Jason will be talking in, in a bit more detail about uh, IDH mutations, but, but that's one paradigm that's clearly impacting the epigenome of tumors harboring these uh, mutations in a metabolic enzyme. The second mode is the notion of nutrient sensing and chromatin modification. Um, so this really is the concept that, that changes in nutrient availability can impact the availability of these key substrates, acetyl-CoA, acetylmethionine, uh, and that this then can impact levels of methylation or acetylation in the cell and um, may serve in a nutrient sensing capacity to allow the cell to mediate an adaptive response to that high or low nutrient condition. And then a third uh, layer of potential regulation of uh, chromatin modifications by metabolites uh, centers on the notion of localized metabolite production and chromatin regulation. Um, and this is much less well understood at present, but there is evidence. Certainly we know that many of these um, enzymes that produce SAM and produce acetyl-CoA actually are present within the nucleus. And in a few studies, these have actually been able to be chipped into uh, chipped to gene promoters and found in complex with uh, transcription factors and with epigenetic writer enzymes, um, suggesting that the, they may be actually involved in really local production of um, of these metabolites in order to mediate specific uh, changes in chromatin modification at specific loci um, in the genome. Really, I think understanding. Um, Really, I think uh, the level of understanding of this is is really just at the beginning right now, and so I'm not going to really talk about this in a lot of detail today. But if you're interested, uh, we do have some specific examples that we discuss in uh, this review article here that I've cited uh, below. Okay, so acetyl-CoA, of course, plays key functions in the cell, both directly in metabolism as well as uh, in signaling, uh, as well as in signaling roles. So acetyl-CoA in mammalian cells really is compartmentalized into mitochondrial pools and then uh, nuclear and cytosolic pools. And, and within mitochondria, acetyl-CoA is produced from nutrient catabolism. So depicted here, you can see that uh, pyruvate generated in glycolysis can enter mitochondria, and it's converted there by the pyruvate dehydrogenase complex into acetyl-CoA. 
acetylcholine then will condense with oxaloacetate to generate citrate and enter the TCA cycle. Um, and so, of course, glucose is a major contributor to mitochondrial acetylcholine pools in um, many cancer cells, but depending on the cell type and the conditions, acetylcholine can also be generated through fatty acid oxidation uh, as well as amino acid catabolism in mitochondria as well. Now, once generated in mitochondria, acetyl-CoA actually cannot cross the mitochondrial membrane. Uh, and so to transfer acetyl-CoA from mitochondria to cytosol, this goes via citrate. So citrate can be exported from mitochondria. And in the cytosol, it is cleaved by the enzyme ATP citrate lyase, or ACLY, to regenerate acetyl-CoA and oxaloacetate outside of mitochondria. And this acetyl-CoA now can be used um, uh, for both in directly in metabolic processes, including in, in biosynthesis of fatty acids and cholesterol, uh, can be used in the hexosamine pathway uh, for synthesis of UDP and acetylglucosamine, and it can also be used in acetylation reactions. Uh, of course, this is not limited to histones. Uh, we'll be talking mostly about histones today, but we know from acetyl proteomics studies that there are actually um, thousands of proteins in a cell that are uh, subject to lysine acetylation. So it's a very uh, prevalent uh, post-translational modification. Okay, so a second major source of acetyl-CoA outside of mitochondria is acetate, uh, and basically acetate is ligated to coenzyme A by the enzyme acetyl-CoA synthetase, or ACSS2, uh, to also generate acetyl-CoA. Uh, and acetate can be derived either intracellularly or taken up from the extracellular environment. So acetate intracellularly uh, can be derived from HDAC reactions, so histone deacetylation actually results in production of acetate. In order to recycle that and bring it back into the acetyl clay pool, uh, this goes via ACSS2. In addition, um, under certain circumstances, cells will also take up acetate from the extracellular environment. Um, and it's worth noting here that actually circulating in the bloodstream is somewhere in the range of about 100 micromolar acetate. Uh, and this is thought to derive pre predominantly from uh, those friendly uh, microbes in the gut. Uh, they produce acetate. And, uh, and so acetate can be derived both from, from extracellular and intracellular sources. Um, I should also mention here, I'm not going to talk about it in, in great depth in this presentation, but there's also emerging evidence that a third source of acetyl-CoA outside of mitochondria uh, may be uh, the pyruvate dehydrogenase complex, which uh, was originally reported by the Michalakis group to be able to translocate to the nucleus under particular conditions such as mitochondrial stress, uh, and additional follow-up uh, studies to that work have identified that this may also be important during specific stages of development um, and in other contexts. So although I won't be talking in detail about that, um, that's something to keep in mind as, as an emergent um, topic within metabolic control of epigenetics. Okay, so the notion that acetyl-CoA availability can impact histone acetylation actually goes back about 10 years now. Uh, and, and the first reports of this actually came from the yeast literature and, and um, a, a, a sort of seminal study from Jeff Buga's group manipulated acetyl-CoA producing enzymes in yeast and were able to observe these really profound and rapid changes in histone acetylation uh, in the yeast, and this really impacted global transcription. And, and this is something that then we have worked on as well. Uh, I worked on this while I was a postdoc in Craig Thompson's lab, uh, and we generated evidence that, in fact, in mammalian cells as well, histone acetylation is sensitive to acetyl-CoA availability and particularly produced via the enzyme ATP citrate lyase. Uh, and so, as you can see here in this plot, we're using RNAi to silence uh, ACL, a ACL or ACLY. You can see these profound reductions in overall histone acetylation. We see a more modest effect in this context with uh, acetyl-CoA synthetase silencing. And I'll just make a note here that the nomenclature has changed. And so this is a little bit of a point of confusion. If you read older literature, it's typically referred to as ACS1, but, but now is, is termed ACSS2. It refers to the same protein, the cytosolic acetyl-CoA synthetase. Um, in any event, we saw a less pronounced effect of silencing this enzyme on histone acetylation levels. Um, however, 
uh, targeting both enzymes led to an even more pronounced suppression. And when you think about this as regulating overall levels of histone acetylation in the cell, um, these types of changes actually are quite uh, profound in, in my mind. Um, and then we were able to rescue the, the defect in histone acetylation seen upon ACLY silencing by supplementing cells with a high level of acetate, suggesting that it really is the availability of acetyl-CoA that's dictating these changes in histone acetylation. Um, and, and so, you know, from one perspective, these findings may seem obvious. Okay, we've gotten rid of enzymes that make acetyl-CoA, and now histone acetylation is going down. But at the same time, you know, this really, I think, was quite, an important observation in the sense that at that time, really, we were thinking about post-translational modifications uh, predominantly from the kinase point of view, which, as I previously mentioned, really are not limited by ATP availability. And so this really is a different paradigm. Um, and then it's also worth noting here that these enzymes, ACLY, um, acetyl-CoA synthetase, these enzymes that previously have been thought of really exclusively in their role, in their direct metabolic roles, which would take place in the cytoplasm, actually are present in the nucleus as well. So you can see that's here with ACLY both in, uh, and ACSS2 uh, in both a biochemical fractionation as well as um, by microscopy. These, these enzymes are also present in the nucleus suggesting that they may need to be there in order to carry out uh, some of these functions in regulating uh, histone acetylation. So, of course, uh, I do want to point out, though, that although we identified a dominant role for ACLY in regulating histone acetylation, there certainly is substantial metabolic flexibility in the system. Um, here, uh, in a context of a genetic knockout of ACLY, uh, we find that cells do proliferate very slowly, um, and what you're looking at, the PC7, 8, and 9, are three clonal cell lines that are completely deficient for ACLY. Um, and you can see that these cell lines proliferate much more slowly than parental cells. Um, but they also upregulate ACSS2, suggesting that they may be using acetate to compensate uh, for glucose-derived acetyl-CoA um, in the absence of ACLY. Uh, and in fact, this is the case, and, and these cells actually now become completely dependent on acetate for their viability. So, um, in, in the, in these experiments, we culture them in, in the top panel here, either in, um, 10% serum that with plenty of glucose, plenty of glutamine, plenty of, you know, other, uh, media components and amino acids, but no acetate and, uh, in the absence of ACLY, these cells actually die, uh, and when we just supplement them back with a little bit of acetate, a physiological level of acetate, they're now able to remain viable, and we're able to trace this acetate carbon into fatty acids uh, and into histones, although the regulation of histone acetylation is a little bit less efficient um, from acetate. So there is substantial metabolic flexibility in this system, which I think is an important consideration to keep in mind as these pathways are potentially uh, targeted uh, from a therapeutic standpoint. Okay, so by manipulating these enzymes that produce acetyl-CoA, we can impact changes in histone acetylation. Um, but, but how sensitive to nutrient availability really is this? Uh, and the answer seems to be that actually uh, quite sensitive. So here, for example, you can see a simple experiment where we culture cells in either high glucose conditions or low glucose conditions or low glucose with an acetate supplementation. And you can see that under low glucose conditions, you have both a suppression of overall histone acetylation levels as well as a, a suppression of cellular acetyl-CoA levels. And both global histone acetylation levels and acetyl-CoA levels can be rescued by supplementing cells um, with acetate, suggesting this uh, this real sensitivity of overall histone acetylation levels to acetyl-CoA abundance. So these, of course, are pretty big changes in overall histone acetylation, which led us to wonder how this might impact gene expression. Uh, and so we reasoned that glucose availability probably regulates gene expression through many different mechanisms. But 
that in the acetate rescue condition, we might be able to identify those genes that are regulated by glucose availability in an acetyl-CoA responsive manner. Uh, and so we did a transcriptional profiling under these conditions, high glucose, low glucose, or uh, low glucose with acetate rescue. Um, and indeed, we found that maybe about 10% of glucose-regulated genes are also responsive to acetate. Uh, and what was quite interesting as we looked at the uh, clustering of, of these genes is that the majority of genes that are uh, induced under low glucose conditions in this overlay of these uh, glucose and acetate regulated genes, uh, the genes that are induced under low glucose conditions by and large are rescued back partially or fully by acetate and only a very small number of genes are regulated in opposite directions by glucose and by acetate. Likewise, genes that are suppressed under low glucose conditions are rescued back partially or fully by acetate and only a small number of genes going in opposite direction, suggesting that this really has enabled us to hone in on those genes that are responding uh, in some way to acetyl-CoA availability in the cell. And so if we look then into to some of the gene ontology of some of these acetyl-CoA upregulated genes, we do see a lot of genes involved in cell cycle, DNA replication, uh, cell adhesion, and so on, um, which, which may be consistent with the idea of acetyl-CoA providing a signal of high nutrient availability and cueing the cell to engage in growth and proliferation. Okay, so oh, so now uh, let's talk just a little bit about uh, how uh, acetyl CoA availability can uh, impact acetyl acetyl transferases. So we know that many lysine acetyl transferases actually have a KM for acetyl CoA that's around one micromolar, and so we wanted to try to understand how uh, what really are the levels of acetyl CoA in the cell, and if that makes sense in terms of regulation of lysine acetyl transferases. Uh, and so here we've done an experiment in which we've carefully quantified levels of acetyl-CoA in the cell, uh, and we found that under high glucose conditions, uh, it's really in the range of about 6 to up to about 13 micromolar in this glioblastoma cell line, and that as we limit glucose availability, this falls down to about 2 to 3 micromolar. Um, and so, you know, it may at first glance not be obvious that, that acetyl-CoA concentrations would be sufficiently limiting to, to impact uh, cat activity. However, I think there are two really important considerations here. Uh, the first is that these are whole cell acetyl-CoA measurements, uh, and, you know, that may, may or may not be reflective of the acetyl-CoA levels that are in the nucleus. Now, this is really a technical limitation. At present, there's not really any validated and rigorous um, methods for quantitation of nuclear acetyl-CoA levels. Um, so we have to do the best that we can with whole cell quantitation. Um, the second consideration is that uh, lysine acetyl transferases produce um, CoA as a product uh, and, and CoA can feed back and inhibit certain acetyl transferases. And, and in fact, we do find that um, under glucose limitation, the ratio of acetyl CoA to CoA also falls over time with glucose limitation. Um, and this notion that uh, the acetyl CoA to CoA ratio may be important in metabolic regulation of lysine acetyl transferases um, was explored in greater detail uh, here in a study from Jordan Meyer's group. And without going into the technical details of this, basically they rely on a chemical probe that binds in the lysine acetyl transferase active site. Uh, and this um, can then pull down the, the acetyl transferase. Um, and then this can be competed off in the presence of, of acetyl-CoA, or uh, if CoA is also binding, uh, CoA can also um, compete with the probe. And so what they were able to find is that certain acetyl transferases, such as PCAP or GCN5, actually um, interact uh, comparably with acetyl-CoA and CoA and thus may be sensitive to changes in that ratio, whereas other acetyl transferases, such as MOP, are much less sensitive, uh, much less responsive to CoA and, and thus may be less responsive to changes in that ratio and would depend on, on changes potentially in absolute levels of acetyl-CoA. Um, and this is something that we have also attempted to experimentally test. Um, in this case, we've worked with isolated nuclei, uh, and you can see here that um, under low uh, under uh, conditions in which we don't supply acetyl-CoA, 
um, there's really a, a low level of histone acetylation. If we dose in some acetyl-CoA, now we get a higher level of acetylation in these isolated nuclei. Uh, but if we hold acetyl-CoA constant and then dose in an increasing amount of CoA, uh, we can uh, suppress back down uh, acetyl-CoA over time, suggesting that, that really um, both acetyl-CoA and CoA can impact uh, levels of histone acetylation in responses to changes in metabolism. Um, so uh, then the question really becomes, given that we know that metabolic alterations in cancer cells contribute to tumor epigenetic regulation, um, does metabolic reprogramming in response to oncogene activation or in response to microenvironmental cues, uh, does it impact the balance of metabolites in the cell in such a way that it impacts uh, the tumor epigenome? Um, and... Uh, and this is something that we have looked at in the context of pancreatic cancer. Um, and, and one thing I just want to highlight to you here is that when we look in, uh, this is using the KPC mouse model of pancreatic cancer, so uh, containing a KRAS, an oncogenic KRAS G12D mutation as well as um, P53 loss of function. Uh, and you can see here in a wild-type animal pancreas, we see an overall low level of histone acetylation in acinar cells, but higher level in ducts. Um, and then in the lesions, we see higher levels of histone acetylation. But what was really striking to us is that actually we see this increase in overall histone acetylation levels in uh, the normal mouse pancreas, and this really precedes uh, any histological abnormalities. So, so this was exciting and suggested that metabolism may be uh, potentially impacting this. Uh, and to probe this a bit further, uh, we have looked at the effect of inhibiting PI3 kinase, or AKT, in uh, primary panin cells derived from these mice, and uh, you can see that either PI3K or AKT inhibition results in a suppression of overall histone acetylation levels, and this corresponds to a decrease in glucose consumption rate um, and a decrease in um, cellular acetyl-CoA levels and the acetyl-CoA-to-CoA ratio. Um, and in addition, uh, the suppression of histone acetylation seen with AKT inhibition uh, can be at least partially rescued um, with uh, acetate supplementation. So I see we're running a little bit short on time, so I'll skip through some of these next details that I was going to discuss. But I'll just suffice to say that one way that AKT seems to be facilitating this is via direct phosphorylation and activation of ATP citrate lyase itself. Uh, which allows cells to continue to produce acetyl-CoA even when glucose becomes a bit more uh, limiting. Uh, and then I just wanted to point out also that we have looked at this in the context of human tumors as well. And, and in fact, in human glioma, we see a, a significant positive correlation between levels of phospho-AKT in tumors and levels of histone acetylation. Uh, and this really bears out in human prostate cancer as well. Uh, we see this multiple histone marks co correlating positively with levels of phospho-AKT serum 473, um, suggesting that AKT activation really may be a key determinant of overall histone acetylation levels in tumors. Uh, and so then uh, with this data, we propose that ACLY-dependent acetyl quay production is impacted both by nutrient availability as well as by oncogenic signaling, uh, and that this likely is impacting tumor uh, growth and proliferation not only through its direct metabolic rules, but also through regulation of acetylation and gene expression. Uh, and so moving forward from here, I think we're really at the tip of an iceberg in terms of understanding the role of acetylation, metabolism, and acetylation in tumorigenesis. Um, some of the key questions really arising from this are, are, you know, what are the mechanisms that confer specificity in terms of gene regulation? Uh, beyond histones, what proteins are acetylated in a nutrient-responsive manner? And really, how does metabolic reprogramming to promote acetyl quay production, how does this really impact tumor development and progression, which I think is a really crucial question that we're very interested in and working on in the lab. Um, and then just to highlight a couple of studies that have come out recently that have begun to get at these questions, um, here is a study from McDonald and colleagues uh, identified that during pancreatic cancer metastasis, there actually is this profound epigenomic reprogramming, and this is linked to changes in anabolic glucose metabolism. So cancer cells may actually be, be able to exploit this metabolism epigenetic link um, uh, in order to promote metastasis. Um, and then this study by Gow and colleagues um, identified that under hypoxic conditions in, in hepatocellular carcinoma, uh, acetate is able to be engaged not only to promote lipid synthesis as a direct uh, building block for fatty acid synthesis, but also via acetylation of genes involved in 
um, in fatty acid synthesis. Um, so, so these are some of the studies that are beginning to get at these questions uh, of mechanism. And I will conclude there and just say thank you to the, the people in the lab whose work I have um, touched on today, including Joyce Lee, Alessandro Carr, and Steve Zhao, um, and many of our wonderful collaborators who have contributed to this work, as well as our funding sources. Um, thank you very much. Fantastic. Thank you uh, so much, Dr. Wellen. Uh, we're going to move uh, right along to our second speaker, Dr. Jason Lokasal. Uh, Dr. Lokasal is a faculty member at Duke University in the Department of Pharmacology and Cancer Biology. Dr. Lokasal's research focuses on understanding metabolism in health and cancer. He has made seminal contributions to our knowledge of metabolism, including the role of serine synthesis in cancers, the role of the Vorberg effect in glucose metabolism, and the characterization of methionine metabolism in mediating methylation dynamics in normal physiology. His laboratory develops and applies state-of-the-art computational and mass spectrometry-based metabolomics approaches and integrates them with current molecular systems level and population-based methodologies. Uh, welcome, Dr. Lucasal, and thank you so much for being on the line. Okay, well, thanks, John. Um, so, uh, yeah, thanks thanks for the invitation and the uh, opportunity to discuss some of um, our work on this really exciting um, topic that's really bridging the interface of two um, two very, um, I guess, historically disparate um, disciplines. Um, and also thanks to science and thanks to self-signaling for um, for sponsoring this um this opportunity, and um, especially thanks for Katie for doing to, um, for for a great talk that really introduced some of the key topics in this area. Um, okay, so before I go into um, the before I go into metabolism and epigenetics, I just want to briefly give an overview on um, on what our lab has been working on, and essentially it's three areas that we focus on. One, we're interested in quantitative biology, where we um, where we develop metabolomics methodology, disseminate it, and use it um, in combination with mathematical modeling and computational approaches to understand um, principles of metabolic regulation and and um, metabolic adaptations. Um, we're also um, very much interested in metabolism epigenetics, which will be the focus of this talk. And further, we also study uh, metabolic therapeutics and um, especially uh, something that we're moving into more these days, which is you know, particularly exciting areas how diet influences cancer. Um, and, and some example, um, some literature um, that gives some examples on some of the recent work we've published in these areas are, um, are on the left there. Um, okay, so for today, what I wanted to do was um, first kind of expand a little bit on some of the introductory concepts that Katie, uh, that Katie mentioned in her um, talk and talk about how this link between epigenetics chromatin biology and metabolism might work, um, and then once with that introduction at hand, um, then I'll briefly discuss a few applications to therapy, particularly in the context of cancer. Um, okay, so sorry, I'm just passing along with. Okay, so. Um, Metabolism. Metabolism at a very high level. And so, and so this is kind of within the context of, you know, you have all this complex biochemistry, uh, involved. And, um, you know, one way to simplify it is to think about the functional roles that metabolism performs to achieve cellular tasks. Um, and, and one basic idea is that dietary sources, fundamental ideas, that dietary sources, um, you know, that, that, you know, comprise of the majority of the caloric, you know, intake that, that humans and, and all organisms um, take up. I mean, are process in the macronutrients, and these macronutrients are then sh are then shuttled into cells um, where they undergo complex biochemical reactions. And 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 what they essentially do, uh, or, or we can think about in a way to simplify what they actually do is um, they, they basically perform three roles. Um, so the two commonly studied roles are that these nutrients provide energy through catabolic processes via their oxidation. They perform bio, they undergo or they allow for cells to undergo biosynthesis 
um, through their anabolism or anabolic processes is involved the, the reduction of these nutrients. But in addition to these two commonly studied um, roles, these nutrients and metabolite and, and the metabolic pathways that are associated and mediated by the processing of these nutrients, um, they also perform signaling tasks. And, and essentially there, there is a requirement for cells to communicate information about metabolism to the rest of cellular machinery. And so that's through, for instance, transcription factors that sense the availability of nutrients like nuclear receptors or, you know, or hypoxia inducible factors that sense the availability of oxygen. But what we're now learning that is in addition to this transcriptional regulation um, that signals nutrients to different cellular outcomes, we're also learning that this met metabolic state is also intimately connected with the epigenetic or the chromatin state, as well as the state of nucleic acids on um, cells. And so how this works, and this was introduced by Katie, and this is a slide from one of her um, recent reviews, um, is that you basically have intermediates within the metabolic network. And these intermediates can be a host of different molecules. These are some examples shown on the slide. Um, but basically what these intermediates do is that they're essentially connected to enzymes. And these enzymes, they have substrates, they have products, and they have allosteric effectors, um, all of which can influence the activity of the enzymes. And so when these enzymes um, are involved in, um, or sorry, before I mention what these enzymes do, I, I should just give a brief example of how this, or, or just evidence for how this happens. And so this was a um, paper that we published about two years ago, which um, which basically showed that if you just take cells, take cells undergoing um you know, different rates of glycolysis that you can control through pharmacological manipulation. Um, that, and, you know, and, and you, and you consider these cells that, you know, have, you know, three different programmed rates of, um, of glucose metabolism. And you do something like a proteomics experiment where you just measure in an unbiased way the acetylation sites on, um, on histones. Um, Basically, what you find is that, you know, particularly in this context here, which is one, you know, cancer cell, NATT116 cells, is that about half of the acetylone on histones is altered. And so basically what we're finding is that, you know, metabolism has a profound effect on, um, on the ability or the status of much of which is considered the chromatin state. Um, in cells. And so the, the basic biochemical principle, which Katie kind of introduced as well in her talk, is that, um, is that it really comes down to how the enzymes that carry out these modifications are designed. Um, so for example, um, typically when we think of signal transduction, we think of, uh, we think of protein kinases and the reversal model, the reversible modification known as phosphorylation. Um, and in those cases, um, there's a metabolic substrate and that metabolic substrate is ATP. However, in the case of kinases, the KMs are typically on the order of micromolar concentration. But ATP is on typically ranges in the, in the you know, millimolar range. So as a result of that, and it's shown here with just these three illustrative curves, is that because the KM of the kinase is much lower than the um, concentration of the ATP, the kinases essentially are not limited by the substrate. And so this is in stark contrast to many of the acetyltransferases and methyltransferases that we currently think about that mediate epigenetics. And so in those cases, the substrates like the acetyl-CoA that Katie mentioned or methionine, which I'm going to go into more detail later on, um, the methyltransferases and acetyltransferases, the KMs are tuned right around the concentration of those metabolites. And so as a result, if we just look at these hypothetical um, enzyme reaction curves here, that changes in intracellular metabolism that change these molecules like methionine or acetyl-CoA, they can have profound effects on the rates 
of these enzymes. And these rate and these effects get even more profound when you have more complicated enzyme chemistry that you know occurs. In, for instance, when some of these methyl transferases are associated with complexes and there's more allosteric regulation associated with their activity. And so, so this essentially is the biochemical basis of what we're thinking about in terms of how metabolism interacts with epigenetics. And so just to, um, you know, uh, and, and, and so when these, um, when these modifications, when these modifications are dynamic, we know downstream, and then there's been a body of literature, some of which uh, Katie introduced um, in her talk, is that, for instance, like if you change the methylation state of the tails of a histone, there are dramatic effects on gene regulation and um, and things as far as health endpoints, like this Wikipedia slide introduces, can be altered in the context of these differences in these marks. And so these are kind of themes that are prevalent in developmental biology, normal physiology, as well as pathophysiology. And, um, and so we can think about, you know, these metabolic networks and how they are dynamically regulated. And if they are dynamically regulated in a way that changes metabolism, that changes metabolism to extent that these modifications that are known to have broad ranging consequences in all, in essentially all of biology. Um, basically what that says is that metabolism can also be a, through these mechanisms, can be a driving force in determining biological phenotype. And so, um, so just going to go into one um, example of this um, regarding methionine metabolism um, and how it relates to epigenetics and chromatin biology. Okay, so methionine metabolism really comes from a larger network known as one carbon metabolism. One way to kind of simplify what one carbon metabolism does is it's a set of metabolic cycles that essentially move one carbon from one place to another. This one carbon comes from nutrients, things like amino acids, glucose, it's, you know, and vitamins as well. Um, and then when these things input into these metabolic cycles, they can then be processed and processed away depending on how the cycle is regulated into different um, physiological or, or, or biological outputs, like things like nucleotide metabolism, redox balance, um, lipid synthesis, and, and also methylation metabolism. And so the way methyl so to introduce the part of one carbon metabolism involving methylation metabolism essentially comes from this methionine cycle. And so this methionine cycle is a metabolic pathway that starts with methionine. Methionine is taken up from cells. It's an essential amino acid. Um, and it can be converted to s methionine, where it donates its methyl group to s homocysteine. Uh, and then after a hydrolase reaction, makes homocysteine. Um, without getting into too much of the biochemistry, basically it can be remethylated through an input of one carbon. And so basically you add one carbon and then you remake methionine and so and the cycle and the cycle continues. Um, and so basically it's a single carbon unit that comes in and a single carbon unit that comes out. And so when this single carbon unit that comes out is involved, um, involves this molecule S-adenosylmethionine, which I'm introducing here, and basically what it does is it um, it couples with the methyl acceptor in cells, and then as a result, it becomes acetylene so homocysteine, and uh, the, the, and, and, the met, and a um, methylated acceptor, or and, and when that, that acceptor can be something like a histone, a DNA, or even RNA. Um, so, uh, okay, so so this is hypothetically how this would work, but I, I guess the first kind of thing when I was starting my lab and we um, kind of had some indirect evidence before uh, related to this, but, but what we wanted to know is whether this, you know, th does this actually happen in a physiological context? And, um, and, and so one clue that kind of came about in terms of profiling the metabolomics of, of humans is that here what I'm doing is I'm plotting the concentration of methionine across a population of human subjects. And basically what we see is that the range 
of um, methionine concentrations in fasting human subjects can be anywhere from 3 to 35 micromolar. Um, and so, so if we compare that to what we typically use when we consider culture medium, like things like DMA, DMEM or RPMI, the standard things that grow, that you use to grow mammalian cells, um, the concentrations of methionine in those media are about 100 micromolar. And so, so basically what that's saying is that the finding concentration in most of the experiments that have been reported in biomedical literature to the extent that cell culture is um, a commonly used model and cell culture and defined uh, commercialized media that have been um, propagated over the years is that essentially there is no regulation of um, histomethylation via um, one carbon metabolism. And the reason why is because methionine is far in excess. Um, of um, of the of the physiological concentrations that are observed in humans. Um, so we just did a very simple experiment where we changed the concentration of methionine in the culture media from 100 micromolar, which is the typical concentration that's used, um, for instance, in this case, RPMI, um, and we just transition the cells to a media growing all else being equal except the um, concentration of methionine is a three micromolar. And basically what we find or what we observe is that there are dramatic effects on histomethylation. So this is this is one um, commonly studied mark in the epigenetics field, uh, trimethylation on uh, H3K4. It's known to code information about cell types in the you know, recent literature on you know, the, the, the structure of the mark at the gene encodes things like you know, the tumor suppressive state of the gene that's you know, involved. Um, and, and so, so there's a lot, and it's also you know, the, the shape of the peak is also involved in different developmental processes. And there's a whole body of literature on this H3K4. But what we're showing here is that you just make a little change or maybe, or not a little change, but you, you basically go from what you typically observe in cell culture experiments to physiological concentrate or to the, you know, within the range of physiological concentrations of methionine. And you see that there's dramatic effects on histomethylation. And so, so basically what this shows is that, you know, it's a process. And, you know, if you can go into some of the details of this paper, and I'd be happy to talk more about it in the discussion, but, you know, we can work out the kinetics, the reversibility, and it basically follows all the features of a biochemically regulated process. Um, okay, so that's kind of the introduction of methionine metabolism and how it kind of relates to, you know, how it relates to histone methylation. Um, but what I want to talk about for the rest of the time available are some applications to cancer. Okay, so why might this be relevant to cancer? Um, so, one, so when I was putting together this talk, I was trying to think of a more commonly known or uh, appreciated example of how normal physiological processes are connected to cancer. And, and so, um, like, for instance, I did my PhD in a, uh, working on growth factor signaling. And, you know, when, when we studied growth factor signaling, basically there was this paradigm where you had a you had a ligand, it bound to a receptor, and then a signaling cascade was triggered where basically kinases are becoming active, kinases activate other ca uh, kinases, and there's a series of events that eventually lead to the activation of a transcription factor that then participates in uh, gene regulation. And so if we think about things like the RAS pathway or the PI3 kinase pathway, these kinases and also their negative regulators like the phosphatases and all the basically all the components I mean, the machinery from the receptor down to the transcription factor are recurrently mutated and, and there are, you know, many, much of the paradigm of targeted therapy in cancer, um, in cancer and translational cancer research, um, and it has, you know, revolved around targeting the mutations that are involved in these pathways. Okay. So, and, and, and so that was always the criticism with metabolism. And, and, and so the criticism with metabolism was, well, you know, most of these enzymes, they're not mutated. So why are you studying these things? Why, you know, may, maybe they're regulated by oncogenes, but that's kind of an indirect thing, and it's not really the source of the cancer. And so, uh, so, so particularly, so, you know, I guess when I was a postdoc with Luke Cantley and we were working on um, cancer metabolism, that was always the major criticism, is this is, this is a bystander. 
of the rest of the oncogenic process. It's something that's sitting on the side. And then so, you know, I spent many, many, many years thinking about how to address the question. And this is the, I guess to this date, the best that we could come up with. Um, and this is a slide that my graduate student, Ihan Lau, put together, I think, last week. Um, you know, and she helped me out a lot for this uh, talk. Um, Okay, so, so how is this related? So, so basically what I'm getting at here is that while the metabolic enzymes are not mutated per se, if we look at the processes that are directly biochemically connected to these, to metabolic enzymes, such as this methionine cycle, basically what we find is that there's a whole class of enzymes that are mutated in cancer. Things like methyltransferases and, you know, all the machinery associated with the chromatin um, and chromatin modifying complexes that are also interacting with these methyl transferases. Um, and these things are, and what we're learning in the past 10 years is that there's a whole new set of oncogenes and tumor suppressor genes, you know, that are selected for in the pathogenesis of cancer and that are, um, you know, recurrently mutated and, uh, and that, that are recurrently mutated and found to be common sources of um, oncogene um, and tumor suppressor gene driven uh, pathogenesis. So in this case, basically what we're seeing is that you have a metabolic network in the same way you have a growth factor. Um, metab and, but what's downstream of it, and, and essentially when the cancer cell co-opts this metabolic network, I mean, one hypothesis could be that in the same way the, the signaling pathway is decoupled from the growth factor when the kinases are mutated, that the metabolic that, that the methyl transferase, something like the MLL or the, you know, the Smith Smith complex, is essentially decoupled from the metabolism when it's mutated. And so, so, so in normal physiology, metabolism may be regulating is regulating part of this, you know, epigenetic machinery. But, but that's essentially what some of these mutations do is that they decouple metabolism from the. Um, they decouple metabolism from the behavior of these. Uh, uh, from the regulation of these enzyme complexes. Okay, so, um, yeah, so, so, so we talked about this methylation mediated by this methionine cycle. And so there's a reverse reaction involving a class of enzymes known as dioxygenases. And these dioxygenases, they use a substrate, uh, known as alpha ketoglutarate. Um, and so, and so while we talked about the methylation of things like histones and, and DNA, the demethylation reaction also involves a metabolic substrate, and that's alpha ketoglutarate, um, and the, and the enzymes, that, and the classes of enzymes that, that mediate it. And so alpha ketoglutarate, just to briefly introduce it, it's a component of the TCA cycle, um, all this macronutrient, the dietary sources of, you know, of caloric intake, you know, eventually feed in to produce something like alpha keto. Glutarate, um, things like glucose, lipids, amino acids, they all go into the TCA cycle, and alpha ketoglutarate is a metabolite in the TCA cycle. And, um, and in fact, um, you know, a topic in the cancer biology field that, you know, needs, needs no introduction, um, you know, is this, is, 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 is the finding from, um, you know, from, uh, Bert Vogelstein's lab in Haiyan at Duke, um, that, that, you know, recurrent mutations in uh, metabolic enzymes involve these isocitrate dehydrogenase enzymes that metabolize alpha ketoglutarate. Um, basically, as Katie mentioned and introduced, um, you know, these, these, these enzymes essentially, as a result of a defective re reduc uh, carboxylation reaction as a result of a, um, you know, an arginine getting mutated, um, basically they produce a, you know, what some call a neomorphic, um, uh, they produce a new product that results from a neomorphic, what's called a neomorphic enzyme activity that involves a production of these 2-HG, 2-hydroxyglutarate, and 2-hydroxyglutarate, when it, uh, when it accumulates in cells, it binds to inhibit things like demethylases as well as TET enzymes, which affect um, modifications on DNA. Um, so that's one example how alpha ketoglutarate is kind of related to this epigenetics. Um, whether it happens in any other pathophysiological conditions, there's a, a paper we contributed to from um, May Kong's lab uh, at City of Hope, where basically um, what she was able to show was that in certain in certain physiological contexts, a pathophysiological context like the tumor microenvironment, that alpha ketoglutarate levels can become very low, and that's you know, some data, for instance, this is, these are some experiments. This is an experiment we did where we showed that, um, 
alpha ketoglutarate, if you go to the center of the tumor, uh, can you know redu- can be reduced by tenfold in its concentration, and concomitantly changes in histone methylation on track with this um, track with this limitation in alpha ketoglutarate. And so basically, what we're what we're seeing here is that this is a way in which changes in metabolic regulation coming from the PCA cycle also affect um, changes in epigenetic status. And so it's and so um, so this paper also showed some direct relevance to this in in the context of cancer therapy, where it turns out that there's some previous work that um, May and others published, which shows that if you um, subject certain um, in this case, these are melanoma cells that have the BFRAS B600E mutation, and they're normally very responsive to the vemurifenib, um, the, the Plexicon drug. Um, and, um, and, and when they're normally responsive to this, if it turns out if you put them in uh, environments such that the glutamine related to the alpha-ketoglutarate is limiting, the cells become resistant. So then how do you reverse or how do you sensitize these resistant these BRAF B600E resistant cells, it turns out that if you target things related to the epigenetic machinery, you can actually resensitize the cells, and that's shown on the graph on the right. So basically what that's showing is that while, you know, there's metabolic adaptations incurring cells, they're contributing to drug resistance, but you can actually overcome them by actually targeting epigenetic machinery. Okay, yeah, so I talk about contributors. So there's a few, I, I just want to, I just briefly in a, in a minute or two just mention a few other examples. Um, so there's a paper uh, published from Nabil Bardizi's group um, by uh, Philippe Katakis, which showed that um, you know in certain uh, certain KRAS driven pancreas models um, that um, you know there's alteration. Basically, what this is showing is that the, there's changes in metabolism, changes in methylation, and the way to therapeutically intervene is by altering metabolism. That was a recent paper um, study. Um, another one that we uh, published recently on uh, DNA methylation dynamics is we um, kind of looked at, we took a machine learning approach from TCGA data and just said, okay, DNA is very, dy- DNA methylation is very dynamic. It varies from patient to patient. Um, what's actually contributing to that variation and um, this is just one example from what came out of some of those um, calculations that if we look at, for instance, methylation of the androgen receptor in prostate cancer, you know, the highest scoring things that are predictive of methylation status, um, you know, much of it kind of is revolved around one carbon metabolism, suggesting that there is some very tight predictive interaction between metabolism and epigenetics, in this, at least in this case of um, prostate cancer and methylation of the androgen receptor. Okay, so that will just quickly wrap up and apologize for the technical difficulties at the end, just to um, knowledge of my lab and the collaborators and funding sources, um, you know, especially especially Yihan and Sam, who did some of the work on the histone methylation, um, May's lab in collaboration with Xiao Jing, who did you know, some of the stuff on the alpha ketoglutarate. And uh, thanks, and um, appreciate the opportunity to again to talk. And if you have any questions, feel free to send me an email or visit our website and um Happy to discuss more at any point. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you uh, so much, Dr. Lucasal, and uh, uh, thank you to both of our speakers for their excellent presentations and for sharing their work with us. Um, apologies to the audience that we've run a little bit over time. I hope you can stick with us, with us for just a couple more minutes. Uh, I'm just going to get to a couple of questions that uh, came in, and um, as Dr. Lucasal uh, kindly offered, he can answer some questions that we didn't get to cover uh, if you want to email him. So uh, very quickly, um, Dr. Wellen, a uh, quick question for you. Why do you think the wind signaling pathway was the most significant pathway uh, that came up when you changed the concentration of uh, um, acetyl-CoA and glucose? Uh, and what do you think is the role of the wind pathway in um, acetyl-CoA regulation? Well, that's a very good question and, and something that we're very interested in as well. Um, so certainly defining the mechanisms that underlie those changes in gene expression is a big ongoing uh, direction of research in, in the lab right now. 
Um, in terms of what's driving uh, the Wnt signature that came up in our gene expression pattern, we actually don't know that yet. We had an original hypothesis that it may relate to beta-catenin acetylation, since beta-catenin has been reported to be acetylated and that that's nutrient responsive. But um, in, in uh, our experiments, that does not seem to account for uh, that gene signature in this data set. So the bottom line is we don't know, but but uh, we are working actively to try to elucidate these mechanisms. Um, but one thing I will say is that we think that there are specific transcription factors that are um, impacting specific uh, – are responding to acetylcholine availability in order to – uh, impart some of this specificity in gene regulation. So we suspect that it's not only about histones and, and is also related to transcription factors that are responding to acetyl-CoA availability as well. Um, and hopefully uh, soon we'll, we'll have some more insights into that question. It's a great question. Uh, Dr. Lucas, I'll uh, one for you. Um, yeah. The, uh, um, uh, could the effect that you see uh, of metabolism on the epigenetic regulation in mammals be passed mm -hmm. down through trans transgenerational uh, epigenetic inheritance? Uh, what are your thoughts? Yeah, that is a very interesting question. Um, so th th there's certainly evidence for it. Um, like, for instance, uh, there's a paper from uh, Andrew Pospisilic published a couple of years ago where they showed that if you can, you know, you change the diet and the parents, and then the offspring, it passes down through multi generations. Um, so what I'm, sh so in, but in addition to that, I mean, some of the th basically what I'm showing or, or, or kind of presenting some data on is that you know, it kind of it looks like you know a lot of these, a lot of this interaction has features of a biochemically regulated signaling pathway. Um, you know, in much of the in much of the ways that you know something like a kinase signal transduction pathway is incurring. So, what I mean by there is that you know you you have changes in methionine availability. You take away the methionine, you add it back. You know, the histones reduce; they they come back. And then, um, and so so in terms of at the level of the methylation, what we're learning is that it's very dynamic and it's very um, you know it's it's highly regulated and reversible. But the open question there is, um, what is this doing to what we really mean by epigenetics? And by epigenetics, we don't mean just, you know, a modification on a chromatin or, you know, some change in a Western blot by, um, by, uh, you know, that, that we observed in, you know, the overall levels of, you know, K27 or K4, et cetera. Um, what we really mean by epigenetics is some kind of inheritable kind of, um, you know, change that's, you know, that, that, that's essentially stable epigenetics in the, you know, true definition of the word. Um, to the extent that that happens, where you can imagine, for instance, like, you know, methionine, say you're, you know, on a vegan diet for three weeks and, you know, your methionine levels get really low and then you come back, you know, and you start eating meat again. Um, are you going to see changes or, or say, you know, during pregnancy, you kind of change the choline intake and in your diet, what happens to your children. I think those are really, um, while maybe the modifications are dynamic, what actually happens downstream of the modifications in terms of gene regulation. And that's also a fundamental question in terms of how chromatin biology actually interacts with epigenetics um, in general. Like, for instance, you know, there's some papers published in Science this week, which, you know, are providing some of the first evidence that K27 seems to have an actual functional role in mediating gene activity downstream. That's still an open question in the field is, you know, what's the cause and what's the consequence of these marks. But, um, but yeah, it, it, it's, it's really something that's going to keep us very busy over the next many years. Well, uh, unfortunately, I think that's all we're going to have time for. Um, so uh, it just remains for me to thank uh, today's speakers very much for uh, taking the time to be with us, uh, Dr. Catherine Wellen from the University of Pennsylvania and uh, Dr. Jason Locasel from Duke University. Uh, please go to the URL uh, now at the bottom of your slide viewer to learn more about resources related to today's discussion. And look out for more webinars from science available at webinar.sciencemag.org. This particular webinar will be made available to view again as an on-demand presentation within about 48 hours from now.
We are interested to know what you thought of the webinar. Send us an email at the address now up in your slide viewer, webinar at AAAS.org. Again, thank you so much to our panel uh, and to Cell Signaling Technology for their kind sponsorship of today's educational seminar. Goodbye. <laughs>